Ta-da! Okay, we can see your work here. Lovely photo. Um, and so just briefly, Anne, if, if you don't know, now you know. Anne is a pioneer in the zero energy design field. She wrote a, like sort of the seminal text on it back in 2008, something like that? 2009. <laughs> Thank you. 2009. That was from memory. Um, and it has been a policy leader, you know, has facilitated countless different meetings and helped shepherd the state towards what we have now, which is a solar code, the first in our country, first really North America, where we're requiring all new low rise construction, three stories or less, to have a zero net electric array, assuming there's a gas load there for 40% of the energy or so. We're not 100% there, I guess I'm saying, but we wouldn't have been here without. And, and others, but really Anne was a huge leader, make no mistake. So um, thank you, Anne, for coming here and discussing with us this sort of thorny issue of like, how do architects and solar panels play nice? And I know that you're wonderful at um, being conciliatory between tensions and go for it. Explain to us how to make this work well. Okay, well, first of all, I think, uh just to set the record straight, Sean is really uh, over crediting my role in all this, but I, I appreciate it. <laughs> and secondly, the answer is the old KISS principle, keep it simple, simpletons. Uh, <laughs> but we'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, it's really not so difficult. It's all about not getting wrapped around the axle. So, if I can, there we go. Now, here's a, the basics of it. We've got sort of five basic principles here. Designing with the end in mind, ask the right questions, set clear goals and metrics, focus on fundamentals, and check progress all along the way. So I will walk through what those, each of those means to me. Designing with the end in mind can mean a lot of things, but all projects have a budget. And this really is the driver for everything. If we know how to think about it right. So in the case of a solar dwelling, the PV is generally the most expensive component. So we want to keep that cost as low as possible so that we have more budget for all the other things that people care about and that are necessary to achieve these goals. To keep the PV cost down, we need really low energy loads for the home the most important thing and the most often overlooked uh, factor in achieving that goal is to keep the form simple and there's a lot more that can be said about that but i've got these little diagrams over here on the right that just sort of give an illustration if you have a basic rectangle in this case doesn't matter whether the units are 100 square feet five units whatever that's five, scale it up however you want. You've got a, an area of five and a perimeter of nine units. The same amount of area enclosed in the cruciform below has, again, five units of area, but a perimeter of 12. So this shows in a very simplified way, one of the impacts of a more complex form. Gosh, somebody told me very recently about a home design. I am going to have to check back with this colleague because it was so mind boggling. I couldn't even get my head around it. But he said that this house that he had worked on at one time had, it was, I believe, well in excess of 100 corners when looking at it in plan form. <laughs> that's just so over the top crazy I, I had to scrape my jaw off the floor but it these things do happen and that type of elaboration is really the antithesis of what we need in order to achieve high performance goals because it flies in the face of everything that we understand that goes into this so and I'll be saying a little bit more about that as I go along so next step after we simplify form is to put a lot of our effort and investment into creating a high performance enclosure. And then within that high performance enclosure, we want very efficient systems. And that means not just the equipment and component pieces, but also 
how those components go together. And we'll talk about those things. All right, so that's number one principle. Number two principle, ask the right question. One of the biggest challenges I've been witnessing in this work for the last couple of decades is we're not necessarily asking the right question. So for example, a number of well-regarded technical studies done by very reputable consulting firms about zero energy projects have started by asking the question, how much extra will it cost to achieve zero energy? And the problem with that is when you think of it as something extra, you think of it as something extra, as something you add on. And in these studies, typically what is being done is to look at homes with no change to design. You know, we take an existing design and we say, well, what do we have to add on to it to make it zero energy? And inevitably that means adding cost in one or more ways, adding more of something, adding a more expensive something. And all of those things result, of course, in added cost. The article I'm showing on the left is a wonderful, cogent, and persuasive discussion of a different way of thinking, which asks instead the question, well, how do we achieve zero? Or how do we achieve high performance? How do we achieve sustainability? Fill in whatever your parameter is in that blank, within budget. And again, this goes back to our first principle. We have a budget. So, and when we think of it instead of, all right, we have a new goal, maybe a goal we have established before, but we're gonna include that as part of what we're going to accomplish within this budget. How do we do that? That's an entirely different question and engages an entirely different mindset. What do we do differently? We're making choices. And design fundamentally is always about making choices and making, making trade-offs. What do we invest in and how do we put all that together in a mindful way? Okay, that's step two. Step three is about setting clear goals and metrics. So we start by asking, all right, what is driving your solar production goal? Sean, as you alluded to at the beginning here, our 2020 code in California isn't a zero net energy goal. It's not a zero emissions goal. It's a zero net electricity goal. And That's, an efficiency goal, you know, a dramatic right. decline in consumption to your point of, you know, what drives your solar production goal. Like they really ratcheted down on HVAC and domestic hot water budgets. Absolutely. But the question of how much solar do you need, it's enough solar to meet the typical electric uses. And yes, that does always require efficiency. So first of all, ask the question, are you simply wanting to include enough solar to meet the energy code? Or might you set a higher goal? Might you be targeting zero net energy or zero emissions? It's important to understand. And there's surprisingly, these are relatively simple questions but there's a lot of confusion around them and misunderstanding because they don't all meet, mean the same thing. Once you have a clear understanding there, the next question is, all right, well, how are you gonna measure that? So we move through a progression of establishing initially an energy use intensity. That's not always where everybody starts. It's where I recommend starting. Then looking at what that means in terms of total load, that's gonna dictate a certain square footage for a solar array, and that in turn leads us to roof area. Those are not the same as we shall shortly see. So energy use intensity or EUI is expressed in KBTU, thousands of British thermal units per square foot per year. And uh, what I'm showing here is a table taken from the 2012 study done by Arup called the Technical Feasibility of Zero Net Energy Buildings in California. So Arup, as this um, title of the study suggests, they were looking on behalf of the state agencies and utilities at 
what would it take to achieve zero net energy? So this was before the new um, zero net electricity code. It's not about zero emissions. Nevertheless, what all three of those goals have in common is they drive a very, very high level of efficiency. In fact, I would say a very comparable level of efficiency across all three goals, different levels of solar. But it's a, it's a pretty decent benchmark as a starting point for, well, what would be a reasonable target to establish for homes? By the way, I think it's also worth mentioning that EUI is a useful metric but it's not what I would consider be all end all, particularly in residential, because the larger a home is, say for a given number of bedrooms, the easier it is to achieve a lower EUI. And this has to do with the ratio of surface area to volume and close. So smaller homes, let's say a 1400 square foot three bedroom home is going to have a harder time of achieving a, an ambitious EUI than a 2,400 or a 3,400 square foot home with three bedrooms. So, you know, just as a caveat there. Nevertheless, what I've done here is used as an example, we're looking at um, a KB2 per square foot year of 12.7 in climate zone three, which is where a lot of Northern Californians live. That represents a lot of our population base. We move from there to a sample calculation using that uh, EUI and applying it to an 800 square foot home in Oakland. And what we would get with those numbers is a load of 22,860 KBTU per year. In order to convert that to units that are meaningful in electricity, we divide by 3.412 to get to kilowatt hours per year which brings us to the number 6,700. Okay, so how much PV does that equate to? Um, I've cited some sources up here. Um, there are many, many sources for coming to these numbers. Ah, sorry about this, a really annoying reminder that keeps popping up that's not even accurate. Um, at any rate, my advice here is don't use these numbers look at the appropriate resource to determine the right numbers for your specific location. What I'm doing here is just walking through a sample calculation and showing you in this case where I got my numbers. But um, there are lots of ways of going about this with credible resources. So in this particular example, we're working with a source that says um, about one kilowatt of DC in California will get you four and a half kilowatt hours per day or 1,642 kilowatt hours per year. So what that means based on our load determined from the prior slides calculation, we end up with 4.1 kilowatts DC for the size of our solar array. That's all great. And we understand that a kilowatt occupies a little more than 68 square feet. And we can multiply that, we get 280.5 square feet. However, we don't specify solar arrays in fractions of square feet. We end up with a round number, an integer number of solar panels. So that in this case rounds to about 12 panels. Okay, so let's look at the space requirement. There's again, variation in size of solar panels, but we're getting towards a little more standardization over the years we've been seeing the solar industry mature. Now it's fairly uh, normal to find panels that are 65 by 39 inches. So with 12 panels, if we had an array such as the one at right, that's two panels high and six panels wide, that would round to roughly 11 feet high and 20 feet wide. Okay, except that um, for the most part, we're looking at a three foot clearance on at least three sides of an array, which adds quite a lot. So don't be thinking that 280 square feet is gonna do it for you. Actually, by the time we add those margins, we're up to 364 square feet. And by the way, that's when there are 
no obstructions in that area. So whenever there are things like roof penetrations, um, anything sticking up or um, blocking the array in any way, it's going to increase that size. So really important to keep all that in mind. Okay, that's how we finished with our third principle there. This really boils down to do the math. All right, so now we know that's what we need to achieve for this particular example, assuming a home of a certain size in a certain location with a certain exposure. Now, in order to build a home that will accommodate that size roof array, we go back to the keep it simple thing. So uh, we've got two illustrations on the right, the do do and the don't do. Now to many, the lower illustration, the don't do looks like a perfectly lovely design. But funny thing, it would be really hard to find 364 square feet of roof space on that structure on which to accommodate a solar array. So this really requires the architect to hold the thought from the very beginning of the design process about what this means for form. And this is why I think it's important to start by doing the math. Um, it's also important because when we get to the next step, which is about enclosure, it's also incredibly difficult to detail and then to build a building that's gonna meet the enclosure specifications we're after. So that's kind of the gist of it for form. Not complicated, actually as uncomplicated as possible. The next fundamental is again this high performance enclosure and there's you know volumes literally volumes have been written about this and uh, it boils down to a few things to pay attention to framing which creates thermal bridges so how do we minimize the thermal bridges how do we address the thermal bridges that we do have how do we make sure that we're doing a very high quality job of insulation and ideally using low carbon materials? And then uh, I think the forgotten stepchild is generally this continuity of barriers issue. It's really the building science community that even uses terminology like this, air barrier, vapor barrier, moisture barrier, let alone understanding the difference between all of them and how to provide appropriate continuity. Also specifying target air leakage rates. So this is an area where architects, I think by and large, have not had much emphasis in the past, don't necessarily have background uh, educationally or professionally in understanding these things, let alone communicating them successfully. So what we need is to really learn how to create drawings that we haven't done before and create specifications that we haven't written before that show how to do all this. Because when the information is not included in a construction drawing set, it's extraordinarily unlikely that these things will be achieved in the actual construction of the building. So architects, this is a very, very critical piece after getting the form right. High performance windows, part of the enclosure, of course, that I think worth calling out, particularly because so many architects, whether the um, bulk of their practice is commercial or residential, are called upon to do uh, custom residential projects from time to time. In some cases, that's the mainstay of an architect's practice and in custom residential very often and i speak from personal experience we have clients who want a view they want views really badly in fact they want it so badly they often want views for their their knees and their shins and ankles and toes don't ask me why but this creates a real problem in creating a high performance enclosure because windows unless you spend an extraordinarily high fraction of the budget on them have 
an R value that's a fraction of the R value that we can achieve in the rest of our exterior building surfaces, walls, floors, and roofs. So we really need to do what we can to keep glass area in check. And of course, this means it's an important part of the architect's job is client education. Because often, you know, you, you do hear, I want floor to ceiling windows to look at this beautiful view. Oh, by the way, and it's unbelievable how often that beautiful view is to the west. And the west is where we have our biggest problems with heat gain, with glare and we have very difficult time providing adequate shading because uh, when the sun is in the west it's a lower angle and will come in under overhangs so this is a real big challenge for architects and needs a lot of attention we also of course need to pay attention to our window specification values the u value which is about thermal um, conductance and solar heat gain coefficient, which is how good a job do we do of excluding the um, UV penetration that gets heat from the uh, radiation of the sun, comes in, hits a solid surface and becomes um, heat in the IR range instead, infrared. So those are our window challenges. Oh, greatly simplified. All right, the next fundamental, I'm really zooming along here because I'm expecting a, a lot of questions and would love a lot of dialogue about this, but moving quickly. So next fundamental piece is the mechanical system. So now we've mastered the enclosure, including the windows, we move on to what goes inside. I think the biggest challenge with really high performance homes is understanding that the loads can and should be so low that our mechanical systems uh, somewhat ironically become more limited limited as the options available that suit them so for example um, we can get loads on almost any i would say normal sized home small enough that it could be met by a ducted mini split a single ducted mini split we've got a number of terrific um, demonstration and research projects throughout california climate zones and even in um, other places that have real climate in fact shasta the shasta and redding area is one part of california that has a climate with uh, heating degree dose Days about the same as Chicago. So we actually do have our own severe climates. And even in that part of the state, we have projects showing that uh, a three quarter ton ducted mini split can serve the needs of a home uh, even about 3,000 square feet. So the, the flip side of that, the inverse of that is almost any type of heating or cooling system that would normally be specified for a home of that size will be oversized. Well, what's the problem with that? Oversized systems have several problems. One of them is they really compromise comfort, ironically, because I think a lot of the HVAC industry operates on a mindset of bigger is better. Um, if you if you wanna be comfortable in a hot climate, we'll give you more air conditioning capacity. If you wanna be comfortable in a cold climate, we'll give you more heating capacity. However, that's um, counterintuitive, or I should say that's the intuitive approach, but, excuse me, water. Mm. The counterintuitive answer is actually smaller systems generally provide better comfort smaller that is that are properly sized because oversized systems will go through rapid cycling so again let's take the example of a uh, home that's heating dominated sorry i've got a throat tickle <coughs> in the winter <coughs> and um so the the furnace in a conventional home will come on blast a large volume of hot air <coughs> heating the space very quickly 
untrip the thermostat to turn the system off again. The home <laughs> cools rapidly because it probably has pretty lousy enclosure <coughs> and that will trigger the system to come on again. So we have this rapid cycling and we'll alternate between parts of the house typically being too hot and then getting cold again. That's also really, really hard on the equipment. So we run through systems really quickly. They don't last, they burn out. So we have an entire industry that is several decades behind where um, we understand our building loads need to be. So it's absolutely, totally normal and typical to see systems that are oversized for the actual loads that will be produced. And then, um, in our high performance homes, this system can really be exacerbated even further. So um, I'm perhaps beating a dead horse here now, but the, the real message here is we've got to do load calculations. The code now requires this. And we have to make sure we're using the correct values and assumptions in those load calculations. We can't use numbers that have been used for decades as standard assumptions because they're not, they're absolutely not going to be accurate or valid in homes that have high performance enclosures. And again, these are all sort of prerequisites to actually achieve our goals for solar, kind of working backwards here. Okay, so we want to pay attention to where we put our equipment distribution systems. This is also something that's really neglected um, as a design issue because a lot of homes are designed with the assumption that the HVAC contractor will figure out where to put things and they will go in uh, crawl spaces, basements, attics, and it's not really of concern for a lot of people designing homes. But it needs to be, and in many cases, our equipment needs to go into conditioned space. So that space also has to be allocated. I've already said a lot about sizing. My cat has an opinion on this as well. You must listen to him. Um, equipment efficiency is important, but it's often the only thing that's given any attention in the HVAC equation. So it, I've, I've left it as number three because it's sort of, gets taken care of because that is what people think of when they think of HVAC efficiency. And distribution system design is another kind of neglected aspect of HVAC. Again, where do we put things? Where do we run things? There's still the vast majority of new homes I see are still having a distribution grills put at outside walls under windows. Well, that's a really, it's a legacy practice from our old homes that had really lousy enclosures from a thermal perspective. And the idea was, well, if you put the grill under, uh, on the exterior wall under a window, then you would be running warm air up in front of that window to help combat the cold that was being radiated through that window and it would also sort of enhance the convective effect of the hot air. All of that is metaphorically out the window with a good quality enclosure because we're really reducing the, um, the uh, well, we're increasing the temperature of the indoor wall relative to the outdoor wall in winter and vice versa in summer. So we're not getting that dramatic differential anymore with a good enclosure. And then um, installation quality and commissioning is always really critical. And we don't have nearly a large enough workforce of contractor who really have experience and understand all of these issues that I've been discussing. So I think it's everybody's job here in this community to really be finding those people and finding those who may not yet have the experience or savvy with this type of system, but who are motivated to learn about it because this is a workforce skill that is terribly lacking and we really need to build it. 
And once again, coming back to the design side of the equation, it's incumbent upon the architects to get the right parameters into the specifications to show the equipment locations, provide as much guidance as possible in those contract documents. Okay, moving on. So we've figured out the, um, the mechanical part. We've mastered that. So we're going to go on to plug loads. So this is easier, but now we're, now we're sort of in the easy zone. Plug loads, I'm using the term a little bit loosely. Some folks don't include lighting because it doesn't all plug in. That's wired in. Um, but I'm basically saying these are the, the, these are the really easy things that uh, just get hooked up to our electrical systems. Um, and this is a much simpler job of specification and we've got some excellent resources. First of all, if you haven't been following the lighting industry in a relatively few short years, we've gone from um, an immature LED market to a very mature LED market where we've got many, many choices of light fixture and bulb form, color temperature, size, color rendering index, dimmables. There is absolutely no reason not to use LED in virtually every application. So that makes me tremendously happy because it's taken a lot of cycles through code development um, to get to this point. And I feel like this is finally no longer a huge issue. The only remaining issue is to make sure that all of our colleagues are equally aware that doing all ED is, there's no barrier to this. For um, appliances and electronics, we have lots of great resources. My personal favorite is Enervy.com. I'm showing a screenshot from Enervy on the right although they keep updating the website and it looks a little bit different every time I see it. The basic idea though is they make it really simple. They give every item a numeric score from zero to a hundred. A hundred is fabulous, of course. So I send um, all my clients and colleagues here and basically say, look, you can put in a lot of search terms. You can specify things like uh, the appliance size. You can even limit to a certain brand and you can put price information in there, all kinds of things, and then look for items that come up with a rating of 90 or better. If you don't like what you see, you can back off from there, going down to 85, 80, and so forth. You, you will also find that depending on which type of appliance or electronic item you're looking at, there may be a relatively minor differential in actual energy performance uh, for changes in numeric score. So um, all that information is available on NRV. And then one of the interesting things I think here too, it used to be for many years that an Energy Star rating was kind of the, the gold standard for appliances and electronics. And then what happened is Energy Star became almost a de facto minimum or, or uniform standard. And at that point, the EPA introduced a new category, Energy Star Most Efficient. So that's also, and they have all kinds of product listings. They keep them very up to date, as does NRV, uh, by the way. So those are great, as is CEE1. That's the um, Consortium for Energy Efficiency. All of them great resources, and they all also have lots of not just listings, but informational resources so you can learn more about these different products and what gets high ratings in each of their different systems. So easy peasy. All right. So that's it for the fundamentals. And then our final piece here, check your progress. This is final, but it's actually a continual thing. So energy modeling is something that is all too frequently treated as a final step of saying, hey, I did my design, now I'm gonna just check the box. We'll run the energy model and we'll show that we've complied. Well, that could work okay for a relatively small population of design professionals 
who have lots and lots of track record, lots of prior experience doing super high performance projects. They already know all this stuff and they can do it in their sleep with one hand metaphorically tied behind their back. For the rest of the design community, it's important to run a design model pretty much as soon as you have anything that resembles a coherent geometric shape and ideally even sooner. I would argue that the best approach is to do what's known in the energy circles as a shoebox model. If you say, okay, well, um, my client is planning to build a 2,400 square foot house, you can say, okay, well, what, what would that look like as a shoebox? Meaning a rectangle that's, let's say, two to one ratio, short sides typically facing east and west, long sides north and south is sort of the ideal configuration. So um, maybe that would be a you know, 30 by 80 foot rectangle or thereabouts. So you can run an energy model very, very simply on a 30 by 80 foot floor plan and make some very basic assumptions about it. And you would come up with a number, um, both an EUI and a um, number of KBTU per square foot per year and KBTU per year and or kilowatt hours per year. And you would understand then order of magnitude, how much energy you are looking at as demand. And then as you evolve the design, continue to see what's happening with your design from an energy perspective as you iterate your form and the other variables in your model, like where are the windows, what way, you know, where do they face? What do you think they're made of? How large are they? And so forth. Because those will really influence your performance. And of course, with a realistic um, compass orientation. So this means energy modeling becomes a real design tool, not something that's a tailpipe exercise at the end of your process. And so you're continually looking at this balance between how much energy are we going to need and how much are we going to be able to produce based on this form that we're evolving. And so this uh, diagram I'm showing here is an example of a project that I worked on with Habitat for Humanity in the Central Valley where the design was pretty well developed and we were in communication with the solar vendor about how much solar we were gonna be able to get on the project. And it shows that the three potential locations for the roof, the solar array were on roof planes A, B, and C. There's a D plane that's not shown that's north facing and it's the, the uh, would be above A and it would be the other side of that gable. So in each case, the vendor was showing us, okay, this is how much we could fit on each of these roof planes based on the obstructions and the um, clearance requirements and so forth. So we knew what we were targeting and uh, we could compare that with the performance of the design using the energy model. The goal here, I know um, just as a little bit of a sort of footnote, there are many criticisms that are levied against energy modeling fairly generally, um, regardless of energy model to say, well, they're, they're not really very accurate. We don't, we can't predict how much energy is gonna be used by the final occupants. That is certainly true. It can be challenging. The exception um, as claimed by the passive house community is that passive house planning package, the PHPP model provides much more accurate predictions of performance. But I wanna, what my comment here really is, we're trying to get in the right ballpark, zero whatever, whether it's zero energy, zero electricity, zero emissions, is very precise. Can't get much more accurate than zero. Realistically, we're not gonna achieve anything quite that accurate. So what we really wanna understand is relative performance in each case, and we wanna understand relative impact of the various design decisions we're making. What's going to make more difference to my design? Is it going to be 
changing the basic form? Is it going to be changing my window specs? Is it going to be changing my insulation specs? Is it going to be achieving um, a tighter enclosure? And the models can give us pretty decent information on most of those questions. So that's the type of thing we want to be looking at as we iterate the design through the development stages. Another aspect of checking progress happens during construction. And once again, a lot of the type of checking that we are most typically doing is again, a when you're finished type of checking. Well, we're gonna see, did you meet your um, blower door numbers targets? Did you meet your um, duct leakage targets? Unfortunately, a lot of that testing is often done so late in the process that it becomes extraordinarily difficult to remedy issues that the testing might yield. So the best approach to dealing with that problem is to require testing be done as construction progresses. So again, I want to emphasize here, the HERS rater isn't responsible for quality management on the job. That's the responsibility of the construction crew. And going back to the goal here to provide design guidance, that means it's up to the architects to specify the quality ma management measures that should be conducted during construction, by whom and when and what those performance targets are. And so ideally, we have a variety of types of diagnostics that can be done at different stages of, of construction. All of that should be spelled out in the specifications. So, and then checked again by the construction crew during the progress of the project. So that's really pretty much it. As you can see, this is not rocket science. It's really more just the classic, not a silver bullet, a hundred silver BBs. Um, I wanted to close though with this final thought, which is that I think a large part of the challenge we face is a perception challenge. And um, there are a couple of analogies that came to mind. When I was younger, people would often look at pampas grass and say, oh, aren't they beautiful? When I was in my, I guess, early 30s, I started to learn quite a bit about native habitats and invasive species. And I came to see pampas grass not as beautiful, but more as these sort of cancerous lesions on the landscapes where they were displacing so many native species that are essential habitat to our wildlife. So that was a perception that changed for me based on my own learning, increase in knowledge. And I've seen a similar or somewhat analogous evolution occur culturally with solar panels that a decade or so ago, many people would say, oh, solar panels, well, yeah, okay, they're great, but oh, they're so ugly. Well, now it's pretty common. I don't think we've dispelled that perception for everyone, but uh, I was looking for some images to include in this, and I found this lovely one on a new home for sale website on the right. So they're proudly showing these solar panels at the front of this um, front, you know, street frontage of this house. It's clearly they're not trying to hide them and the homes are being promoted as solar homes. So this is a, you know, a point of pride for the developer. And one presumes, since they're trying to sell them, that they believe that the buyers will also view them favorably and not as something that's ugly. So as designers, again, I believe it is a large part of our job to be educating our clients about what is really beautiful. And what is beautiful is what functions well, what serves multiple purposes, not simply being reduced to aesthetics. So I come back to the image I showed earlier as the, one of the what not to do examples and say, well, 
there are a lot of people who might find that beautiful and I find it on a purely aesthetic plane to be somewhat appealing I confess but there's this overlay I can't avoid anymore because I know too much where I look at that and I think oh my they they really missed the boat here because it's going to be almost impossible for that home to install a solar array that would even come close to meeting its needs. And oh my goodness, there are so many challenges that have been created through this design in terms of, it, let's say, risks of moisture intrusion because it's so difficult to build that. And if it were done properly, the architect would have had to design dozens, scores of details for all of these complicated intersections between different materials and different planes and all these different roof lines. By contrast, um, on the image on the right from my dear friends and colleagues, um, David Arkin and Annie Tilt at Arkin Tilt Architects, they've really mastered the use of simple forms in beautiful ways and incorporating solar. And this is you know, one of numerous projects and there are many, many other very fine architects who are producing zero energy homes, zero energy, zero emissions, zero electric homes that do understand and can produce very beautiful forms without creating things that are just so crazy elaborate that they can't be detailed, can't be built, can't be air sealed and can't have enough solar provided on them. So that is my pitch that uh, we all are in this essentially um, with a necessity of becoming educators of all of the people we interact with in our fields. And of course, at the same time, we benefit by being educated by them at the same time and their fields of knowledge and their values and what matters to them and how we best respond to their values and concerns. And that's about it for me. Um, I put up this slide that has a bunch of resources and as I comment, each one of these sources is, this is a sort of a Matryoshka doll um, slide because they're layered within these many, many other resources. And I believe these slides will be available to you so you don't need to be frantically jotting down all these URLs. Thank you very much for your time. And I, again, would love to have some comments and dialogue. Woo! Yay! <laughs> so um, I had a question, and this is a, a qualitative one. Um, so when you're looking at a roof, and, and as you pointed out, you know, it, could you bring up the image that you had a few slides back of the problem? That, there we go. The somewhat attractive but problematic roof. So, how much is too much? You know, I, Frank Lloyd Wright famously had terribly leaky roofs. I'm from Wisconsin, just like he was, and that was a, you know, his stuff is all over the place, leaking like a sieve. Uh, yep. Famously, always, really expensive to maintain his buildings. So, what do you think? What is too much? If you were to say, for instance, look at this roof on the left, uh, what would you do to make it better without? getting rid of, say, the color aesthetic or the basic shape ideas here? Would you just get rid of, I mean, like, what would you do? Yeah, great question. Um, well, I guess the first thing I would say is it, it would be best to start over <laughs> because um, the how do we, what do we add or what do we change to this thing that we've already designed as a complete artifact is exactly what produces the additive cost phenomenon that I was commenting earlier. So in essence, you can't do this by sort of a nip and a tuck here and there. You have to start with the right sort of mindset in order to achieve all the goals you're after. Okay, so but, that said, I mean, it, but I mean, trying to think just from, so I want to apply some of the concepts here so I can handle it. So like, for instance, I'm looking at the front and there's sort of like a double roof line. There's one that's coming towards yeah. us, and then it drops down and then it continues and then it's got all the fancy woodwork. Right. right? Okay, okay, so yeah, I'm with you and I, I, I'll go there. 
I think that's one thing. Again, if I were going to say, okay, we're going to do triage on this, somebody's already designed it. And by the way, this happens all the time, right? Like, mm -hmm. I wish people would always start with that mindset and they don't. And so typically when I get involved in a project, sometimes these decisions have already been made. So I do have to do this. I just would like, I'm trying to put myself out of work here. <laughs> but yeah, so I would say let's, let's get rid of this bi-level front. You can retain the really lovely ornamentation of that portico in the contrasting wood. Just raise it up and have it be a continuation of the upper roof. And then the other thing, similarly, we have the cross gables at two layers on the left. And what's kind of interesting and goofy about that, I guess my, my pointer works here. So there's this little bit of ornamentation in this woodwork under this roof line. Well, honestly, if I were standing on the ground in front of this house, which I'm not, you know, the photographer took this from an elevated position or you wouldn't actually see this. That's a waste. That's a, a waste of money on ornamentation that will probably not even really be seen from any realistic angle. Get well, rid of it. There's no window behind it. And if there was, it'd block right. it. Like right, exactly. Yeah. And this is an area where that's, it's going to be tremendously hard to detail all this. And like, what's this all about to this little notch? Uh, that's like, there's no rationale for that. It's just stupid. Um, another thing that I would say is, you know, I don't necessarily have a real beef with these ornamental um, pop-outs, except for the fact that, well, facts, there's several things. Okay, so we have this situation where you've got these two roof planes, the angled one on this side of this little pop-out and the roof that it comes out from hitting this side wall in a way where, again, this, this whole intersection or set of intersections is just tremendously problematic yeah. from a detailing and construction perspective. Whereas if you want to pop out, if you'd moved it five feet to the left, right. you could solve that much more easily. Exactly. So when you've got you know, similar situation up here, first of all, really is this position to be very graceful? Hard to tell because we don't see that angle on this building, but I would suspect not. Um, so I'd say that probably should, this whole bit should either go away or be utilized someplace else where it's more rational. So that's just an example of, of some of the things that I would look at. Oh, and another thing about this pop out, one of my pet peeves is um, bays that aren't bays. You know, bay window should have glass on all sides of it because the whole point of a bay is to allow someone inside the building to have a, um, the experience of a sort of a cat's eye view of the outside of the building. We well, really don't get that if you're just pushing glass that was on the facade of the building farther forward without allowing the view out the sides. There's no glass on the side of this. So this is absolutely pointless. It's just what I call exterior decoration. It's not actually architecture. So there's, you know, there is a, uh, there's phenomenons in the whole world of exterior ornamentation that is si silly, but people like to frill things up. And so to your point though, like th these things are placed in ways that are hard to finish, hard to waterproof, as you'd said, and create like all these sh shadows and broken roof lines. You have to have like fire walks set, like fire department set asides. From yeah. the edges, so you're constantly losing extra four foot here, extra four foot there. Yep. There's hardly anything left to work with. Yep. Okay, so I appreciate you going there with me. Thank you. <laughs> and, and I understand your reluctance and I really appreciate it though. Um, <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> I have, um, I always enjoy putting slides up, uh, houses that I love to hate in, <laughs> when I do like long classes. And we have a lot of fun with them. And I, I certainly hope the people who design those houses never show up in my classes <laughs> or on these webinars. <laughs>
Right. Because yeah. you don't like, it's not personal. You're just having a good time. No, exactly. <laughs> it's an educational experience. <laughs> yeah. This is sort of like, um, like, you know, queer eye for the straight guy kind of thing. Like there's a certain amount of sassy critique, <laughs> loving, sassy, you know, it, loving, very good, good natured, you know, to help you out. Um, yeah. This is the, the Ann I for all the straight yeah. architects out there. The Ann I for the wacky roof. <laughs> so we are um, approaching the very end. Is there anything else? It doesn't look like we've got a typed in question yet, but I do know that we've got Jack who's waiting here in the wings to start up his, uh, his HVAC presentation. Okay. Here okay. Go. So, yay, and thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for your careful organization of the process to making a good building. I really hope that we, um, oh, quick, 